Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly. She is the chair of the Department of Dermatology at the UC Irvine School of Medicine. She earned her MD from UCLA School of Medicine, did residency in dermatology at UC Irvine, and did fellowship and laser applications in dermatology, where she received the David Packard Fellowship. Dr. Kelly is a professor of dermatology and surgery at UCI School of Medicine and is a clinical and translational researcher, having authored numerous peer-reviewed publications, many book chapters with ongoing NIH-funded research. She's been honored with many awards, including Physician of Excellence Award and ASLMS Presidential Citation for Contributions in Port Wine Stain Treatments and Laser Education, and so many more. She is a wonderful mentor, and much more can be said. And now I'll give the floor to Dr. Kelly. Well, thank you, Fabian, for that very kind introduction. And already this afternoon, we've talked a little bit about port wine birthmark treatment. And so I'm going to try to just kind of give an overview. And then, of course, later on in the questions, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that people have. So I know some of this we've already had, so I'm going to go through this part quickly. sturge weber syndrome is a condition that, of course, affects the skin, the eyes, and the brain, and not everyone has all manifestations, uh, but I'm specifically going to be talking about the port wine birthmark portion. Now, early treatments of port wine birthmarks, people tried a lot of things. And when I say early, I'm talking about like the 1950s, 1960s, something like that. People tried like cutting them out. Obviously, that caused scarring. Cryosurgery, some of you might have gone to the dermatologist and they'll freeze something. And people tried that for port wine birthmarks, but also didn't work very well, or even radiation. And none of those were very good choices. So lasers were developed in the 70s, um, and actually the earlier there was earlier work on it, but laser just stands for light amplification stimulated emission of radiation. And that seems like a complicated term, uh, but I just want to really show you that really a laser is just a special kind of light. And so the way you can understand how it's special compared to a light bulb, we'll go over a little bit here. So a light bulb has light that is going in, that is multiple colors. So it's polychromatic, it has many colors, uh, um, but a laser has generally one color. And when we're treating a port wine birthmark, we choose a color that specifically is gonna be absorbed by red. A light bulb also has in incoherent light, which means it's the light is going in all different directions. But a laser, all the light is traveling together and it's going in one direction. And our light bulb was relatively not intense. You can stand next to it and not get injured, but our laser um, is intense. And so having those of these three characteristics, the one color that we've specifically chosen, so it's the right color to treat red, uh, having all the light go in the same direction, and then an intense light makes this a powerful therapeutic tool, although it's just light, but it's just specialized light. So we use lasers a lot in dermatology or, or the study of the skin. We treat blood vessel lesions, which the port wine birthmark is, but we can also use different lasers to treat brown spots, to remove tattoos, for laser hair removal, and to rejuvenate the skin after it's been damaged. Basically, what we're trying to do here is we want to target, with our um, laser light, a select colored structure in the skin. And when we're talking about a port wine birthmark, that colored structure are the blood vessels. Now, uh, early on uh, with treatments, they uh, they developed a, an argon laser, which was developed for treatment of port wine birthmarks. But the earliest laser, even though they were lasers with this these certain uh, characteristics, they were still causing damage to the skin. And the reason was because we hadn't learned to use the lasers well. Rox Anderson at um, the Wellman Laboratories in uh, Boston uh, with John Parrish came up with this theory of selective photothermolysis, which made our lasers such more powerful tools. What they said is if you choose the right wavelength, so that again, we're gonna have it only absorbed by the blood. And if we choose one that's not gonna be absorbed by the surrounding tissue, we can really have kind of a magic bullet. I mentioned earlier that you know we can treat patients of all ages because we really are not hurting the surface of the skin with the pulsed eye laser, for example. The laser light passes through the surface and then it's absorbed by those blood vessels. 
And this just kind of shows you uh, in, a, in a picture how the laser light can be absorbed specifically by different colors. And if we choose different wavelengths or different types of lasers, we can get absorption by different colors. And then we can selectively target. Again, for port wine birthmarks, we're gonna be targeting red. And this is what happens when we use our lasers. This is actually a chick egg. And uh, we've used the laser, the pulse dye laser on it. But notice you can see where the blood vessels are have damage. They're leaking out, which is what would cause like a bruise in a person. But also notice that the surrounding tissue is not damaged, that we've really been able to just target that blood vessel, cause little breaks in the blood vessel, but not hurt the surrounding area. And that's really what we want to do with our treatments. Now, there are three important settings in order to be able to use our um, lasers specifically. We have to choose the right wavelength or color of light. I've mentioned that a few times. We also have to choose the right amount of time of the pulse duration. That's how long the laser light is on for each pulse. And then we have to get the right energy. And you have to have all three of those right in order to be able to have a selective treatment, which is our goal. You can see we have these little blue flags here are all different types of lasers that we have. And you can see there are a lot of different lasers that can be used. But for the most part, we've you've heard today about the pulse dye laser and then also the KTP laser. Uh, Fabian mentioned it in her talk earlier. There are other lasers that we also use, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, that can go deeper. For example, the Alexandrite or the NDA. But notice with those red peaks, you can see that the pulse dye laser and the KTP are much closer to a peak. And that's what we want to do is have something that is absorbed by red as much as possible. Now, selective photothermolysis, this concept of choosing certain settings of our lasers in order to get the best improvement, improved our treatment outcomes a lot. But there were still some significant challenges. It takes multiple treatments, and that is still the case today. We're hoping with, with being able to design our treatments better with some of the technologies we talked about earlier, that will get better, but it does take multiple treatments. For the most part, we can make lesions much lighter, but we rarely remove it 100%. And it's very hard to treat patients with darker skin types. Not impossible, but more difficult, which is we would not like it to be. We wanna be able to treat everyone equally. And the treatments, as many of you may know, can be quite uncomfortable and we'd like to improve that as much as possible. Now there was the technology that's developed and anyone who's had later treatment recently almost certainly has had this, which was epidermal cooling. Cooling the surface of the skin, which is called the epidermis, Fabian went over that earlier, and by cooling that surface, as the laser light passes through that surface and goes to the blood vessel, it stays cool. This allows us to treat patients of all skin types. It also allows us to be able to um, do it without causing blisters. And the reason is because the laser light normally as it passed through might be absorbed by that surface, but by cooling the surface of the skin, we can avoid that. And this was also developed at UC Irvine uh, by uh, Lars Fossand, uh, Stuart Nelson and Tom Milner. Here you can kind of see it in action where um, you cool the surface of the skin, it protects that surface. So again, as the laser light passes through, it can affect those blood vessels underneath. Now, cryogen spray cooling from the inventors that I mentioned was the first type of cooling, but there are other types of cooling, contact cooling, which is a cool place, plate on the area, or air cooling, kind of like a, air a hair dryer, but cold air. However, those are a little less selective, and sometimes they cool down the blood vessels and can make treatments less effective. Here are examples of those different types of cooling devices. Here's the cryogen spray cooling that I mentioned, and you can see it's it's a millisecond spurt of a long chemical name, tetrafluoroethane. But really the point is that you can see it's this little spray. It makes, it cools down the sur surface of the skin. It makes the treatment more comfortable, allows us to treat all skin types. And it actually allows us to use higher energies of the laser as well because we protected the surface. But here again, you can see there are other types, contact cooling. This is that little cold plate that I mentioned. Oh, and here we go. Here's, oh, sorry. Here's the air cooling, which again is kind of like a hair dryer, but cold air comes out of it. So this uh, epidermal cooling again allows us to use higher and more effective energy. It allows us to treat all skin types and it also decreases treatment discomfort. I wish you could say it takes all the discomfort away. It doesn't, but it does significantly improve things. 
So when we're doing laser treatments in preparation, it's important for people to have as much sun protection as possible because the more color that we have on the top of the skin, even with the epidermal cooling, it can be the light can be absorbed there. And so we minimize that as we can so the laser light can pass through and get to the blood vessels underneath. It's also important that we make sure that any patient uh, with Sturge Weber syndrome also gets their annual eye exams and also does a neuro neurology exam, either of those as is appropriate for the patient. Now, the other thing that it's important to talk about is, you know, choosing an option because as I mentioned, the pain, there can be pain associated with these treatments. Um, and so we wanna make sure that when you're having these treatments that you discuss with the person who's gonna be doing the treatment, what is the best way to do it for you? Some patients don't like to use anesthesia because they don't like to use medications or they feel that they can do the treatment well without. Some people use a topical medicine that you can put on the surface of the skin. It doesn't take all the discomfort away, but it can help. Some people use medicines uh, that we inject into that area um, that can help take away uh, some of this comfort. Some people use a medication that we give systemically, so a pain medicine that we give either injected into the arm or that's taken by mouth that can help with some of the pain. And then if it's a really extensive area, and especially for children in the range of Two, four, two, three, four, five, six, something like that. And sometimes we use general anesthesia. It's important for uh, every patient and or family to discuss with the person who's going to be the laser treatment, what is the best option for them? Fabian did a really great uh, review of um, some of the pain um, management options that people have. And you can see there was a nice review that came up in 2017. And again, people found that many of the things I mentioned, the uh, Emla cream or lidocaine, it's either four or 5% was one option. You can cool the skin. We talked about that. And that does help some, but may not be enough. But for some people it is. There's pneumatic skin cooling, which is actually using air to kind of suck up the skin into the area. And that creates negative pressure, which some people feel can help. Um, but again, it's important for everyone to be able to discuss with their individual clinician all the pros and cons of the, the different option and choose the one that's best for them. Now, I mentioned general anesthesia, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, although I'm happy to answer any questions about it, but the question about general anesthesia or not, I would say for most adults, we can certainly make the treatment comfortable enough as much as possible um, for them. But if it's very, uh, if it is causing the patient um, significant pain or distress, there is the option for general anesthesia. For the most part, when patients are having this, they're mo mostly healthy and the anesthesia, we don't need too long for our treatments. So we can generally do the treatments in five or 10 minutes and sometimes even less, but it's certainly not needed for everyone. Now it is true that there has been some concern for very young children, so children under two, um, two or three years of age, that it is possible that general anesthesia can affect brain development. So that is certainly something that people are uh, researching. And for very young children, again, very important for people to have the conversation with the person who's going to do the laser treatment and or an anesthesiologist if they're con considering general anesthesia. A couple other things in preparation for laser treatment, we always have eye protection. And so sometimes if it's uh, lower down, you can see this patient has these kind of laser safe stickers that go over the eyelids. But if we're treating the eyelid, then we'll put in these corneal shields, which you see on the top, those little silver circles there. They're kind of like metal contact lenses and we can put a little numbing drop in the eye and then a lubricant so they go in nice and easily. And then we can um, uh, put them there and do a very safe treatment uh, on the eyelid. However, it is important if you're treating the eyelid that you do have this um, special protection with these corneal she shields. Uh, I just wanted to add, if a patient is not being treated on their face, for example, then sometimes we'll use goggles as well. But for facial treatments, either stickers like this, or again, the corneal eye shields. This is a picture of our um, of our laser room, one of our laser rooms. And you can see we have a multiple different lasers because there are different ones we can use. Again, we talked, Fabian talked earlier today about the pulse dye laser and the long pulse 532, and those are two of the options, but we do have multiple options that we can use. This kind of shows, this is a patient who is immediately after a port wine birthmark treatment. 
And if you look at where it says B, you can see that the brighter colors like red are where there's increased blood flow. And you can see where the port wine birthmark is. But immediately after the treatment, you can see the blue, which means that we've shut down those blood vessels and stopped the blood flow there. And that is an effective treatment. Afterwards, often there can be some um, swelling and some discomfort. So we generally have the patient use some ice in the area. I always put um, some cold aloe vera gel on as well. Um, sometimes, you, oftentimes you can get some swelling, especially if you're treating in the eye area. So uh, for older children and adults where it's appropriate, they can sleep with an extra pillow, pillow to raise their head up. Um, and then sometimes patients afterwards will need um, some pain medicine, for example, acetaminophen. Tylenol is an example of a, brain, of a brand name of that. And for the most part, though, most patients do not need any more than that. And then if a patient gets a scab or a blister, they can use some sterile petrolatum. Again, Vaseline is a brand name of that they can use. And then the sun protection is important, just like I said before the treatment. It is absolutely true that multiple treatments are required. We hope that one day we're going to have to have... Um, less treatments that are required, but for the time being, it is quite a few, and we generally do them at about four to eight week intervals. Now, poor white birthmarks can change over time. This was a nice study done by Roy Geronimus in New York. This is just one patient, and not every patient will their port wine birthmark progress like this. But in, in and now having many people that we followed, I've been doing this for 27 years now, so I have a number of patients that I followed since they were young children. It does seem that our laser treatments, hopefully, and do appear to be helping to minimize progression of the port wine birthmark where it would get thicker and develop nodules. Some patients who have a port wine birthmark, the area on the side of their port wine birthmark will become a little thicker. You can see this patient may have a little bit thicker lip on the side of their port wine birthmark. And that sometimes can be addressed with laser, but sometimes we work with other colleagues, for example, like the ear, nose, and throat surgeons. And sometimes for people who have really significant enlargement in an area, uh, they can help do some surgery to diminish that or take it away. Now, some people also ask, how early can you start the laser? And we do think that we get a better result when we start in very young infants. There's a variety of reasons for that. I said that, you know, the blood is the target and infants have some extra red uh, colored hemoglobin in their blood vessels that gives them an extra target. The vessels are probably smaller in very young patients and there's probably less pigment that blocks the light as it's trying to get to the blood vessels as well as differences in skin thickness like uh, Fabian was talking about earlier. So as much as possible, we like to start even in the first week of life. But again, as I also mentioned, we can treat patients of all ages and I have to have patients well into their 90s. Can laser be combined with medication? We talked a little bit about that earlier as well. And yes, we're working on that, but it's something we need to, we haven't found the right medication for port wine birthmarks yet. So it's something we need to continue to study. And the work of um, William and their group is really looking to try to find new medications, as well as a number of other labs across the country. The University of Wisconsin is doing some great work there. You can see actually here, so I showed you before how after the laser treatment, the blood flow went down, but one week later, there's actually increased blood flow in that spot. And that's because the skin likes to heal. This is a good thing that the skin heals, but when it does that, it makes new blood vessels in there. And that's why sometimes we don't make as much improvement as we'd like because there's the, there's the constant treatment and then the healing process, and that does limit some of the effect. Now we talked about the GNAQ mutation, so I won't talk about that very much, but this was a very exciting discovery and the Serge Weber Foundation and other groups uh, had significant uh, were funding in terms of helping to discover this. And it really gives us the, a target that we'll may be able to use, that a target for our medications that we may be able to ultimately come up with additional treatments. And you can see this is an example of the kind of pathways. It's uh, We don't need to go through it, but just the point is that there are a lot of scientists in the country trying to look at these pathways and to find medications that will ultimately be helpful for port wine birthmarks and Sturge-Weber syndrome. These are some of the medications that have been tried in the past. Miquimod and rapamycin, also called sirolimus, propranolol, and timolol. None of them has really proven to have a huge effect on port wine birthmarks. So again, that's why we're looking at other medications. As I mentioned, the research is ongoing. Now there are other diseases um, where they have found medications, other diseases related to birthmarks where they have found medications. 
This is a PIK3CA mutation, so a different mutation than the GNAQ mutation, but also causes um, blood vessel lesions. Uh, and some can look, some are port wine birthmarks. And this particular um, group showed a, me a medication that really dramatically helped these patients. And so there are some medications, again, not yet um, for most port wine birthmarks, but there is, you can see here as an example that there is the possibility that we're going to have great treatments for the future, like they are starting to get for some other um, conditions. Here's another condition, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, where people get red spots, extra blood vessels. And again, there's a medicine, pazopinib, that is being studied now uh, because it is able to help some of those blood vessels to go away. So these are some of the medications we'll be looking at, but of course there are many others and maybe even one that people haven't even thought of yet. I mentioned the University of Wisconsin, so I'm super excited to be working with um, both Lisa Arkin and Beth Drolet, who are also very involved in the Sturge Weber Foundation at trying to look at other medications and then that some of the research that you heard from Fabian and William earlier. As you know, the Serge Weber Foundation is a fantastic organization that really helps to fund all of these things and really is here to help everyone. And I just want to thank them again. Thank you all for listening. There are a number of great questions. Fabian, do you want to work with me and perhaps we can do this together? Um, yeah. Let's see. I had um, one question that was um, at the top there from the um, skin standpoint. Sorry, let me trying to organize them here that I have was, um, is the less, laser less effective on older patients? Um, well, I will tell you it can be, but I will also tell you that it's really individualized. We sometimes have children who respond very well and children who don't respond as well. Uh, and then we have adults who respond really well and some adults who don't respond as well. So each birthmark is a little bit different. We do think that if we start really early, like I say, in the first year of life, we often achieve the best results. But again, there are also adults who achieve great results. How can I, go ahead, Faye, but do you wanna ask a question to Dr. Maybe we'll move through the various things. So maybe Dr. Sun next. Okay, yeah, Dr. So was also answering some of the questions. I saw, um, he, yes, you're amazing, Dr. So, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, there was a question I uh, from Kristen Short to you in regards to the treatment of the eyelid and if there's a benefit with laser therapy. Sure. So um, it really depends. You know, some people do get thickening of the eyelid um, and or some discomfort there. So that would be the advantage of doing it is just to treat the birthmark in the area. But I do have some patients who don't like to have the shields, you know, in their eye. And so we just don't treat the eyelid. And so then that area still has the birthmark and some areas may not. But it's really an individual decision. And, and that is the advantage. It doesn't, for example, if you treated the port wine birthmark on the surface, it doesn't, for example, improve the glaucoma or anything like that. It only helps for the skin portion. Okay. And then another question for you, Dr. Kelly from Meredith Sardo. Um, she states, my son's scalp was treated as a baby. He's 12 and the hair hasn't grown back. He's a little bit self-conscious. Is there anything that can be done to reverse that? So this is a good question. And, um, you know, there are hair specialists. We have pe people who lose hair, not necessarily from laser treatments, but from all different kinds of things. And you can have hair transplants and things like that. Now, it is a little bit of an involved procedure, and I'm not saying you want to jump to that, that but that is a potential option. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, we are not always great. They're getting to be new medications, for example, that are used for all kinds of alopecia, alopecia being the fancy word for hair loss. And um, there are, and so there are new medications, but they're for different kinds of hair loss. If the hair, there, we have these stem cells in our hair follicles that allow the hair to regrow. So if the stem cells are still there, it is possible that they'll come back with time or that we'll be able to stimulate it with the medication. But there aren't really good medications. So again, there'd be something like hair transplant. This is something for people to consider because it is true that with laser treatments, if you do repetitive treatments in an area that you can have decreased hair in an area. I also, there also, for example, this can sometimes happen in patients, for example, boys who are treated on say the mustache area, uh, they may have decreased hair on that side of the mustache when they get older, even if they're treated as a young child as possible. So just something to keep in mind. 
Hey, and then just a comment from Robin in terms of uh, she states as an adult with storage driver syndrome, when I get migraines, I agree aspirin helps. And I take exceptorin, aspirin, acetaminophen, caffeine. Not sure if these are all safe. And I think this may be directed to Dr. Sonari. Yeah, so actually um, we recommend our, our little ones taking small dose aspirin daily. Uh, but yes, um, I, my at least my teenage patients, they they are allowed to take the, the medications that, um, that contain caffeine. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for that recommendation. And then for you, Dr. Kelly, um, in terms of the the maintenance treatments for babies, uh, a question was raised about how, like what you would recommend the patient had or the person has a 22 month old and what you would say about that. And that's something you should talk to the person who's doing your laser surgery about because everyone's a little bit different. I have some patients who will like stop treatments for a little while and we might wait a year or two and then we'll go back to treatments and maybe we'll do two to four treatments. I have other patients because their birthmark tends to come back a little bit more that we treat every three months. So it depends on a lot of different factors. And so I think it's really important to discuss with the person during your laser surgery so you can come up with the best option um, for each individual person. Okay. And then do we have any questions for Dr. Sa? I, I think most of the, co the comments, like he was able to answer them, but if anybody wanted to say anything. Yes. Dr. Sa, is there is there any treatment for the appearance of the the um I'm sorry, I'm not going to describe it well, but the the veins and the that appear on the whites of the eye? Yes. Um so it depends on the, the severity of the um the uh, conjunctival uh, dilatations. Uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it can actually be removed, especially if these blood vessels are uh, congregated and pedunculated, if it's raised. And we call that a pyogenic granuloma. Um, and, and then we can actually excise it. Um, but if it's very diffuse, uh, then um, some have tried laser therapy to kill off the feeder vessels to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, shrink it. And that actually does work. Uh, but it really depends on the severity and also how ex extensive it is. But if it's more localized, then yes, surgery can be considered. So then can the laser, can laser surgery around the, you know, on the eyelids and underneath the, the eye, the lower eyelid, the skin, does, can that also, when you talk about sort of cutting off the source, does that, can that potentially help the, the veins in the eye or it's, they're completely separate? Yeah, they have a different blood supply and also it's a different laser that I, I don't think we use the same type of laser. We use what we call argon laser. It's a heat, it's a heat generated. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not really looking for cosmesis. We're trying to kill off the blood vessels using heat. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're using different types of lasers. And, and Dr. Kelly did a great job of the history of the laser. And there are different, there are many different types of lasers. And depending on what is it that you're trying to do, whether are you trying to cut it, are you trying to heat it, are you trying, depending on the, the purpose, uh, there are different types of lasers. And of course, using lasers for wrong purpose can be disastrous. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, I had a similar question. I'll ask it now too for Chris, Dr. Kelly, um, which was, I many, many years, the old, old school argon laser. Um, I had that done first um, with scarring, of course. Now you mentioned the argon KTP that, how is that different? And obviously I would assume the results are different slash better. <laughs> Let me clarify that the KTP laser is not an argon laser. It's a, a KTP stands for potassium titanyl phosphate, which is a type of crystal that generates um, the light. So it is not like the org old argon lasers at all. It's a different crystal and different way of um, developing or delivering light so that it can be used uh, in laser form. And um, it does not have the I mean, any laser always has the potential to cause injury if not used correctly, but um, it is designed well so that it doesn't have the problems that the argon laser had years ago. And the problem with the argon laser years ago is, again, we didn't know these concepts about like the um, selective photothermolysis that I mentioned and the cooling. And so now we have learned much more over decades so we can do the treatments much more safely. 
Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And then a question for you, Dr. Sack from Greta. Have you placed more than two shunts in any of your patients? Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a, a, you know, to make sure that everyone is all on the same page, um, there are different types of procedures that's available for, uh, for glaucoma. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for babies that's less than typically five, uh, we do a, what we call the goniotomies and trabeculotomies, the pictures that I've shown you. Uh, but if those things fail, or if they tend to, de if they develop a glaucoma later in life, uh, then usually shunt procedure is needed. So what shunt procedure is that we are, you're using a tube that goes into the eye and this tube uh, 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 work, it works as a conduit and it drains the fluid through the, uh, this cannula and then it goes into a reservoir. Uh, and there are many different types of techniques and different types of devices that are available. And sometimes one is not sufficient or sometimes it fails. And instead of people taking it out, they would put a second one in. Uh, but uh, I've never seen more than two. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, not going to, uh, you know, I, I don't have, um, I only had one patient who actually had to have a shunt and uh, the patient did well. Uh, so usually, uh, if you have to uh, place more than two, um, that you're in a very difficult situation and you may have to think about some other options because uh, you're running out of real estate because remember the eyeball is not very big and there aren't too many places you can place the reservoir. Good question. You're asking a lot of very difficult questions. Did you? This was great. Thank you. And then uh, just thoughts uh, from Dr. Sanari. Um, so Meredith had said that her son has glaucoma and a port wine stain on the right uh, F1 MRI at 14 months came clean, does not have any seizures. And she says that she doesn't notice any memory issues um, and ADHD, but can't figure out if this could be related to the Sturge Weber or anesthesia from lasers. So any thoughts? Um, higher chance that there's an association with with Sturge Weber um, uh, than than the 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 anesthesia. Um, I assume that he's much older now than 14 months uh, since we're noticing memory issues and ADHD. So I'd probably have him evaluated by uh, by your um, primary care physician, discuss that, and then consider if, if you know, a trip to uh, see uh, a neurologist would be, would be necessary. I, I definitely would look into it. Okay. And then also Julie states her son, 40 years old, has headaches related to growth and thickening of the port wine stain, taking ephedrine, but it doesn't really help. So any thoughts or suggestions? Um, difficult to say based on 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 those few informations. I, I would recommend, um, you know, seeing, uh, seeing um, your or his neurologist. Um, sometimes multiple days of sleep, how sleep, how's diet, how's exercise. So those things can help. Um, but, but as I mentioned, there are sometimes medications that we use daily um, as prevention uh, for these frequent headaches um, that, that can help, um, and particularly with Sturge Weber. So I, I definitely have him evaluated. Thank you. And for you, Dr. Kelly, uh, from Megan, uh, are there any recommendations for super dry scaly skin on the scalp, on the birthmark? Uh, tr they've tried ketoconazole shampoo, uh, steroid cream, but um, it's just like super gross and they're not with it. So it really depends why you have the scaling on the area. So good, then, so it is helpful to you know work with your dermatologist to kind of see. For some people, it sounds like if they use the ketoconazole or Nizril shampoo, they're thinking whether it could be like seborrheic dermatitis. And then there are you have tried some of the medicines we use, but we can also use um, things that have like a combination of an oil, like a peanut oil, in combination with the topical steroid. And for some patients, that will work a little bit better. 
If it was more like an eczema thing, then sometimes a topical steroid and you might need a different strength of one. Um, and it's well known that birthmarks will sometimes have, for example, eczema in it, and then patients may not have the eczema anywhere else. So sometimes that's the case. And But either of those, we should be able to to treat. So either by adjusting the strength of the medication or trying some other medications like the combination of um, the peanut oil and the topical steroid. Okay, thank you. And then just two more questions for you, Dr. Kelly, uh, in terms of uh, Julie's asking what could be done for scalp pain related to the port wine birthmark growth. Also um, from Judy, what do you recommend for treating scalp sores that never heal? stating her daughter has a vascular bubble removed from the top of the head four years ago, but it didn't heal and it continues to bleed and scab continuously. Well, we could also ask, we'll also ask Dr. Scenario about the scalp pain if she had any thoughts. I will, I will say from the skin standpoint, sometimes treating with the laser and if we're able to get um, effective treatment, then sometimes discomfort in the area will improve. Again, it depends a little bit about what it is causing the pain, if it's thickening of blood vessels, et cetera. Uh, or if, if it's thickening related to the extra blood vessels, sometimes removing the blood vessels will help or decreasing the number of blood vessels. But again, there might be something else going on with the nerve. So Dr. Stonari, I welcome your input. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, would would it's would have an evaluation done and and you know maybe even looking if if there's something um, underlying. So sounds like it's maybe not just a skin pain, maybe it could be a headache. And, you know, if, if there's an underlying lesion on the brain and, and, you know, that's, that's a different, different issue. So I, I, I would definitely um, have him evaluated and be, depending on what level um, um, of the skin or, or in the brain, the, 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 the changes are, then the, then the treatment is different. Um, so nerve related pain, like we like using gabapentin, but then if it's on, on the, on the brain, then maybe uh, something else like topiramine and, and whatnot. Yes. And then the other question about, um, I think it was a nodule. So there are a variety of things. Sometimes we use laser to treat nodule. You know, I did mention that there are lasers that can go a little bit deeper. They have longer wavelengths, so they can go deeper into the skin. And so sometimes we'll use those like a 755 nanometer Alexandrite or a long pulsed um, 1064 and DAG laser. And we can use those for nodules. Or sometimes we will just cut the nodules out and that um, also can be done. And that's out, but you know, of course we numb it up first and then we can take a little instrument to remove that and put one little stitch in it. And so they can be removed. So I, I guess it depends, is it a nodule or, you know, if it's sores from something else, for example, an infection or something else that is happening there, then it would be a different approach. But if it's a nodule from the port wine birthmark, again, either laser or sometimes just removing the, the nodule by cutting it out can be done. So if I can respond, it is a nodule and we did oh, have it removed. You. Yeah, it, we had it removed, but it never, she just keeps picking the scab off and it just we, it's a, it's been four years and we never can get it healed. So I didn't know if there was a special shampoo or whether we should go try a laser treatment on that because it's removal didn't, didn't solve the problem, remove the nodule, but it caused a repeating scab. <laughs> I guess that are, they're, again, are almost like the last question, honestly, I think there are two possibilities here. I mean, it could be that the nodule is not completely removed, but anything that just never heals should always be biopsied on the skin because there are a variety of reasons that can be happening. But it's possible, for example, that there's a little nerve injury or nerve change that's happening there. And that may also um, be resulting in the picking up the area, you know, because it's uncomfortable, et cetera. Um, and so that could be contributing. So might be something there as well, but you could consider doing a little biopsy there, you know, just to see if there's anything going on in the skin. And if there's not, then um, perhaps also discussing with neurology. And again, Dr. Snorari, I welcome your input. Yeah, no, um, nothing else to add. Um, I agree with that. May I answer to the next question since I started talking? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt? I did not mean to. No, 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 not at all. Um, but since I, um, no, no, since I uh, like started talking after you, if if I may may answer to the the next question that I saw on the on the chat. Um, um, so Meredith was asking if the MRI was clean at 14 months and you know seizure free and and now he's um 
um, age of 10, uh, is there still a risk for developing seizures? So sometimes we do see progression of uh, the brain changes. So even if, if the little one has a normal MRI of the brain, um, this vascular malformation can be so subtle uh, when the kiddos are little that we don't see it um, on the MRI and then later down the line we do. So since there are uh, neural complaints, so memory issues and, and um, attention uh, changes and, and whatnot, I would definitely have um, him re-evaluated with a neurologist and I you know, would uh, consider repeating the MRI. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And a question from Robin for Dr. Sa. Can you repeat what it's called, the raised blood vessels in the eye um, and ways to get rid of it? Yeah. Oh, the, um, so the, the raised blood vessels are, uh, we call that pyogenic granuloma, pyogenic granuloma. So these are blood vessels that are congregated in one location and it gets pedunculated. It just kind of arises. Um, uh, and there are different things that can cause pyogenic granuloma, but Serge Weber is one of them. And we excise it. If, if it's something that's causing irritation, that's persistent, then we would, uh, we would excise it. And it's underneath the eyelid or it's on the conjunctival side. It's not on the surface. It's not something you could, uh, um, but sometimes if it gets pedunculated, then it will be visible. It'd be something that will be protruding out, uh, out of the eye. Thank you so much. And do we have any other questions? Any, any other comments? Do you mind? I, I just want to thank Oh, please go ahead. I'm sorry, Julia. I'm sorry. Please. Yes, no, no, no. I just wanted to first off say thank you. You guys have done an amazing job here today. Um, Dr. Kelly has always been an advocate here for the foundation. And this isn't her first mini summit. She comes to me all the time and says, can I do a mini summit? And she always brings the great team with her. I got the luxury of meeting Febin um, just a couple of weeks ago and she's amazing. And Dr. Sue, I know we've met before. Thank you so much for all your time with us today. And this is our first time, Dr. Stanari, but thank you. I appreciate it. So does the foundation. Um, just to recap two things, if you don't mind, um, you will get a survey after the meeting. Um, and it'll ask you, you know, how did we do today? What did you like? What didn't you like? All of those good survey things we do. But the one thing it will ask you if you want to be a part of the BBMC project. Um, it will also ask you about a study that Shabba Juhas is doing up in Detroit. Um, which would allow you to get an MRI and um, a cognitive uh, testing done. And it's um, something that he would, um, it's uh, funded by the NIH. And I just like to let everyone know that, that it's there because it um, he will review it with you, with Amy Lott, another neurologist that we work with, as well as um, the neuropsychologist there. Um, and finally, because my good friend, Kristen, reminded me too, we do have um, uh, new um, talks that we do, um, some adult chats. So for us caregivers that are, you know, crazy and helicopter and do all kinds of fun stuff that way, um, we do have a caregiver talk that we do um, every other month. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, please email me. And then for adult patients, um, we have another caregiver gr a group for that as well with Louis Sandoval. Um, and it's really been a lot of fun to get to know each other and do those things too. So I just wanted to let you know they're there. But Kristen, thank you. You've done a great job as always and, and your team is fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you to the Sturge Weber Foundation. Thank you all for joining us today. Fabian, thank you for leading us and for your great talk. Dr. Sonari and Dr. Sa, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you guys all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Judy, <laughs> from Iowa. <laughs>